like it's time to begin. Welcome everyone to this session of the Virtual World MOOC 2020. Um, I'm very happy to introduce um, our speaker today. We have worked together for oh, probably 10 years. Um, Sheila Weber of the uh, University of Sheffield in the UK um, is a library and information science researcher, and she is a champion of literacy and how is it in, is, is changing in digital culture, which you know is also my passion. So I have admired her work for a, a long time, and I know you're going to enjoy hearing her session on a really intriguing topic ageism. So Sheila, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Val. Um, I'm going to start by just typing into text chat that there are references on this slide um, and that they're on a Google Doc which you can access. So I've put them in the Google Doc rather than on the slide. Um, also, I put my slides on SlideShare. There is a, a previous version of this which has most of the slides that I'm presenting today already on SlideShare. I presented this at um, a conference, a librarian's conference earlier in the year, uh, a slightly shorter presentation. But I still used pictures from Second Life because to me, Second Life is one of the places where ageism doesn't exist so much as it does in some other places. So I'll be coming on to that right at the end. Um, so this is, uh, as you'll see, it's me um, actually on a build by for those of you who like shopping, uh, DRD, Death Row Designs, uh, have gotten, it was one of their apocalyptic buildings. And I thought it gave some of the um, ideas that you get sometimes as an older person that you should be uh, gone and you weren't welcome. So the outline for this session, and I'll just put that into text chat as well, is that I'm going to start by talking about what is ageism um, and say also something about ageism in a time of coronavirus. And then I'm going to go on to focus more on the library side of things. First of all, talking about ageism and the workplace. So library, librarians, though actually um, quite a lot of what I, I think all of what I would say would apply to other workplaces as well. And then thinking about ageism in relation to people um, who are taking advantage of librarians, the services provided by libraries. So first of all, ageism can affect people of any age, but um, I'm focusing on ageism and older people, but certainly ageism can affect younger people as well, or indeed middle-aged people. And some I've had some triggers for my growing awareness of ageism, um, and a key one of these is me getting older, I imagine. Um, and so I'll just type into set text chat um, something because uh, these are just pictures, so they need a bit more explanation if you don't have voice. Um, and so there's two here. One of them is my senior rail card in the UK. Uh, you can get a 30% discount on rail travel. And until the corona virus, I traveled a lot on train. I don't drive. My family doesn't drive. I use public transport, um, which in the UK is more feasible than in some other countries, I think, for as a kind of life choice. Um, so that's a signal that I am an older person. Um, I also get can get on the buses for free, for example, now in my own country. Um, and so that's an indicator. Also, that's a picture of my mother uh, when she was younger. She died age 91 in 2013. And as with many people, uh, my father had actually died 30 years before. So I think that's something else that makes you think about your own mortality and makes you more aware of yourself as an older person. And at the top, there's a a reference to an article by Bill Johnston, who I've worked with for many years on information literacy. And he's become latterly also an activist in the older people's movement in Scotland, which is where he lives. Um, and that's uh, one of the articles he wrote was called A Shielded Cage. It was a, a, an article opinion piece. Um, and his growing interest and in his activism has made me more of an activist as well. 
some further triggers for my awareness of the uh, issue of ageism. And again, I'm just going to post something into chat, a bit more perspective on that. Um, it's been my involvement in UNESCO's, that's the United Nations arm that looks at social and educational cultural issues. They're, I've been involved in their media and information and I'm in their media and information literacy initiatives. I've been going more to media literacy and MIL conferences um, in different parts of the world. And that made me aware how um, there was a big focus on on encouraging younger people to be media and information issues with some really interesting initiatives, really exciting things like the one I quote here, where we'll host, the, um, it was an initiative from a, uh, an organisation funded by the European Union. Um, we'll host 13 dynamic international young people willing to spend their holidays surrounded by nature and fun while contributing to the field. And they had to, they'd learnt lots of things. They were going to create videos. Whereas older people are more or less invisible. Um, it's getting a little bit better, but still uh, the voice of the older person, as, a, as opposed to people who just happen to be old, but in terms of actually studying and meeting the needs of older people, they were more or less ignored. And uh, tend to be talked about in terms of um, deficit, like this one um, I've mentioned here uh, from Aging in Place, which is a, a UK initiative. Um, seniors in a digital world can easily be overwhelmed by all the new technology around us, making big generalizations about how old people just need to catch up and um, really only organizing dull events for old people, sort of really exciting ones for young people and dull ones for older people, doesn't seem. Um, I felt I should say something about my own positionality, where where I stand, um, and in those terms, uh, just going to again type this in text chat, which is the text plus a few extra notes to make sense of it. So I am in what's called the baby boomer generation. I'm 67. Uh, I'm female. Uh, white in the physical world. I'm English. I was born in England. Um, I've lived in England and Scotland. Um, obviously travelled outside there, but that's my nationality. Um, I'm actually the principal wage earner. I have no children. Um, and then there's other features about me. For example, where I am now as a, an academic, uh, it's quite a privileged position. I'm still, I haven't retired yet, so I'm getting what could be considered a good salary, I have my own house and so forth. But uh, I started with less privilege. I was the first in either side of my family to go to university, for example. Um, both my parents left a school at age 14. So um, I have different things, as we all do, that affect how I see things. Um, and I just thought I'd mention that there was an article I read, um, this one that I cite here and put in text chat, that made me that brought this even more into focus. Um, it was article written by um, a millennial and a late millennial, um, and they did talk about that issue and something about their position in this article. Um, but I, they were discussing some of the same articles that by that time I'd read, and I realised that we were getting different things out of them. They were seeing all the stuff that was supporting their argument that millennials were, uh, I'm actually simplifying, but they were putting a lot of stress on on the evidence that millennials got discriminated against uh, and kind of bad mouthed. And I'd been reading into the same articles much more. I'd been noticing the things that gave evidence that older people were discriminated against. Um, and also I noticed um, that, for example, although they talked about their age, they didn't talk about their the fact that they were from North America. And obviously the situation in the UK and the USA, for example, has many similarities but also differences. So I'm aware, aware that this is an international audience and I'm talking from a UK perspective and particularly when I'm giving um, kind of everyday examples I, I will be using that. So finally I'm going to just now define ageism and I'm using the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights definition. Uh, again I'll that that it's the stereotyping of prejudice, prejudice or discrimination against individuals or groups based on their age. 
Although ageism can target young people, most studies in this area focus on the unfair treatment of older people. Ageism is deeply structural, finding expression in institutional systems, individual attitudes and intergenerational relationships. And I've added in small um, type at the bottom and also put in text chat with a little bit more explanation. But this affects people, you can see it from a cognitive point of view, what do people think uh, about older people? affective, how do they feel about older people, um, and then behavioural, what do they actually do um, that is or is not ageist. And the micro, meso and macro levels are thinking about what happens in everyday small situations through to how ageism can be shown or, or avoided, uh, combated at the national and international level through legislation, um, through what national culture says about um, age and ageism and so forth. Um, and so one thing I'd like you to do, um, and I'm going to come back to this in a few slides time. Oh, so I'll give a few minutes for people to type in and just keep, keep talking. You can ignore me for a few minutes while you type in if you want, um, to ask you whether you've experienced ageism at any age. Um, so question to you. And so also, perhaps, if, if there's anything that comes up in the Zoom chat, um, you could retype it. So what I'm going to do in a few slides time is, is, is trill back through the text chat, um, because as you might have gathered, this is a fairly full and a traditional presentation. Um, so I'm mostly just going ahead. But um, uh, I'll, I'll take a look at that, particularly in a few slides time. So Ageism doesn't get talked about as much as some um, types of discrimination, but it is there's an awful lot of it about, frankly. And uh, so there was one European study that was done in 2015, uh, which showed that discrimination or harassment because of old age is the most frequently mentioned type of discrimination. 42% of Europeans perceive discrimination due to old age. Uh, which they were c categorizing here as being over 55, which seems quite young to me now, as very or fairly widespread in their country. Um, I would add the note that I, I I'm aware that the status of elders and stereotypes of ageism vary a lot depending on the culture. There are some cultures where the young people may be still quite oppressed and bound by the tradition of the elders and not all old people, but certain elders that have power. And so there, the issue may be more ageism against young people than ageism against old people. Um, but there are other cultures, and I suppose personally I feel the UK is more like that, where there seems to be a lot of focus on the opinions of young people. And obviously old people in power get their voice, but um, older people en masse don't seem to be necessarily And there's quite a lot of uh, research um, into the way in which older people have been portrayed. And I'm just uh, quoting from some of it here. Um, so older people, so this was one study which um, Canvas people's use, that older people are more likely to be portrayed. Oh, I think this was, yes, this was in fact... Um, they're studying other, it was a synthesis, it was a review. Older people are more likely to be portrayed as senile, ugly, stupid, unskilled, unproductive, unhealthy, badly dressed, sedentary and inactive. All portrayals aligned with negative old age stereotypes of low competence and physical mental decline. And I've put there a, a photo I took of a, um, a British road sign, where, which I think is near a care home. And it's the road sign for elderly people. And these, it's two very stereotyped elderly people that are there in silhouette. But I also feel that if you're not that kind, the other stereotype now is that you're supposed to be very fit and slim and, and have the right tastes and have kind of the right kind of short, fashionable hair um, and be the perfect grandparent and good at cooking. But I think there's this other um, uh, type of stereotype there as well. So I'm going to go back and look at the text chat um, in a minute or so um, uh, as a whole, rather than trying to follow it now. 
Uh, I thought I'd give a couple of examples from the media. One, this first one, um, reproduces some bookmarks from a very recent campaign. And again, I'm going to put that in text chat. Um, UNESCO, which I think ought to know better. And so they had a series of bookmarks this year. April is World 23rd is World Book and Copyright Day. And they had, they featured people of different ages. Oh, excuse me a moment. I was just taking a sip of water. They had um, people of different ages and ethnicities on um, bookmarks that you could print out and use as publicity for the day. But the one with an older woman um, was read so you never feel alone. Um, so per perpetrating the idea that an old person is going to need, would be alone and needs escapism. Um, and uh, I put there uh, a quote from the British Gerontology Society, which produced a really interesting statement around the time of the, uh, after the COVID epidemic pointing out the problems of stereotyping old people. Increasingly, media discourse is also promoting you all older people are lonely and socially isolated. Contrary to this discourse, the evidence shows that loneliness and social isolation affect people of all ages. Recent studies suggest that young adults may be at greater risk of loneliness than older adults. Another um, example was from another opinion piece that was done by my friend Bill Johnston um, very recently, um, and I clicked through, he said it's gone online, I clicked through to it, um, and in it he was calling for an anti-ageist COVID-19 response. So again, I'll just type this in. That. Um, and he, so he was, uh, asked, so, as I said, it was giving a, a very um, anti-ageist um, and particularly pointing out the problems of how it was all focused on grand grandparents not being able to get in touch with their grandchildren. It wasn't really taking older people um, at their own value. But the person who'd put it on the website had just um, used a, a website where you can get copyright free photos typed in ageing and grab the first one, which is a rather, in fact, the more that you look at it, the more dubious it is. It's got this old, frail hand li reaching out to a young toddler, and it's really not appropriate. And I think, and I've experienced actually a similar problem, um, similar problems with articles in uh, kind of professional journals, where the, the sub-editor has um, chosen inappropriate images by being just very lazy and looking at kind of the first few words and then picking an image that, that cuts across from what you're actually trying to say or in some cases the opposite. Um, and uh, apologies for this one because um, this, I didn't have time to transcribe this slide which has got basically a lot of words associated with older people that emerged from a research study, positive stereotypes and negative stereotypes. I think so um, you may not be able to read them all properly, but I have given the reference, which as I said is on the Google Doc um, and the page reference as well. Um, but the negative stereotypes are things like asexual, boring, bothersome, cautious, costly to employ, declining physical and cognitive health, dependent, depressed, depressing, difficult, disabled, easily confused, feeble, forgetful, forgettable, frail, frustrating, grumpy, ill, ill-natured, inactive, incompetent, and so forth. Um, I think it's quite interesting. Some of the, even some of the positive ones seem to me a bit um, negative as well. As I said, this emerged from um, a research study. Um, so all of that, uh, I'm just putting that forward. You may have already been very willing to believe that ageism exists, but also there is a good body of literature out there showing that it exists, identifying ways in which it kind of manifests itself. And again, you can observe this sadly in everyday life as well. Um, so there has been conversation in text chat. I'm just going to go back.
Yes, so I'm just going to read out, is, is that okay? I'm just going to read out um, a few of the um, items from text chat. So Nitro PL said, in the hospital, we will not treat grandma because she is too old, she will die anyway. And that's one of the horrid narratives that's come out of the coronavirus in particular. Um, and I touch on that a bit later on. Maggie Larimore saying, when I was 50, a close friend who's 15 years younger felt the need to take my arm whenever we went downstairs, and I certainly didn't need it at that age. Um, also saying, now people are shocked that at 69 I still have a part-time job plus equal hours on my own thing. I should be sitting and knitting, some folks think. Is listen to Marley's examples of many friends in real life who've worked into their 80s and beyond. So it's like, excuse me? And Widget Whitebury says, now in the US there are too few geriatricians and too little awareness that metabolism and psychosocial needs change as we age. Nellie says, older people are considered very poor and using technology. And Marley says, it varies according to work environments as well. Therapists like me can work well into their old age and are more venerated for their wisdom and life experiences. Other work situations, not, not so much. <coughs> Selby says, I never experienced age discrimination, but I was a professor. Uh, Widget said, gender must be a factor too. Nelly said, no wrinkles. <laughs> um, Sumi and Magic said, my mum was in her 70s and 80s and wanted a part-time job, and she found if she put her age on applications, she did not get the job, but if she left her age off, she got part-time jobs. She loved working in gift shops selling knickknacks. And Maggie says, friends who did physical work have definitely slowed down. But those of us who teach or do clinical work, writers and so on, we have a longer reach. Val said, I work with seniors, some over 90, in my retirement living centre where I serve as a librarian. They tell me young people often think they're clueless, especially with technology. I find them intelligent with a wealth of life experience or so often often looked, overlooked. And Maggie said, I had a friend who was an academic editor who worked till she was 92. She needed a letter from her employer to get her driver's licence approved every year. She was a better driver than I was, and I was in my fittest at the time. Um, and Marley say, and I think this was relating to the um, bit about loneliness, actually many older people are more content than many younger people. They don't have to please people, can make their own decisions about how they live and more. Um, also Molly saying where age prejudice shows up a lot, at least in the US, is with dating. And, and yes, I think that's true, that's certainly true in the UK as well. With um, Yes, I won't go into that, but yes, it's, that's certainly... I think there's lots and lots of evidence, anecdotal and kind of research about that. So thank you for that. So some of these points will have come up already, but um, I just wanted to, in the next slide say a little bit about um, COVID. And this slide, I'm just saying on the text chat, has some quotations and um, hashtags that arose around the time in the UK. So there is a hashtag, hashtag OK Boomer, where people who are younger are, I think, often mocking the ideas of older people, um, kind of writing them off by using OK, hashtag OK Boomer. And I think one of the problems was that although it it sort of disappeared and people, it got fairly quickly for people saying they had, realising they shouldn't be doing this. It mutated into the hashtag boomer removal or boomer remover, um, talking about COVID in, a, in an approving way to get rid of all these irritating, overprivileged um, boomer generation. Um, the quotation, many more families are going to lose loved ones before their time, is one from uh, my Prime Minister, um, who isn't quite as bad as Trump, but that's, that's not saying very much. Um, so I'm not a personal supporter of his, but he gave this, um, in some ways it had some honesty about it, saying a lot of people are going to die. But it also seemed, um, it wasn't talking to the people who were, were going to die, who were most, who quite a lot of them were older. It was actually talking to the younger people about, okay, you're going to have to lose old people. Uh, the, they've had 
third time was from a radio um, debate about if there are too few respirators, should you take an old person off it to put a young person on there? And some people saying yes, because the other people have had their time. Um, also, there was a, a sort of scandal in the end emerge that uh, apparent that doctors were saying that older residents of care homes weren't going to be admitted to hospital if they got COVID, i.e. they were going to be left to die, um, because it was felt that that would put too much pressure to take them into hospital. And also quite a lot of debate about whether the problem could be solved if just all the old people stayed at home. Um, and so a lot of ageist ideas kind of seem to come to the surface. Yes, and Maggie says a lot of us have been broken, working hard for all of our lives. So this picture of us all as wealthy and stodgy is so irritating. Um, so on the next slide, um, another aspect of that, which is more well-meaning, um, is what Bill was referring, Bill Johnston was referring to as the shielded cage. Yeah, it, did you, there was also a discourse, and I heard it, um, kind of anecdotally again from my friends, the, the idea that, that children were naturally, kind of middle-aged children in particular, were very worried about their parents, um, were sort of forcing them to stay at home and talking about them, I suppose they were infantilizing them in essentially, uh, not allowing that the older people could actually make their own decisions about um, whether or not they wanted to take the risk of going out or staying in. Um, for good, obviously for loving reasons, but it was still nevertheless taking away the agency of the older people. And we're talking about the older people as if they didn't, they were incapable of actually making their own decisions. And also some casual ageism, um, because it irritates me a lot. I've quoted this one, which is from a BBC radio pro quiz show, comedy quiz show, um, where the, the host was talking about uh, the introduction of an app that was supposed to track you all the time so that you could tell who you're, if you caught coronavirus, who you've been in contact with. But you can hear the sort of collective sigh of everyone under 40, can't you, knowing they're going to have weeks of phone calls from their parents going, the app's gone funny, I don't know what to do. So um, this usual tired stereotyping. So finally, I'm coming on to ageism and the workforce. And the first thing is to say that older people are very active in the workforce. I and mean, we've already had some examples here today of people mentioning that. And this is just a statistic um, from a couple of British sources that, for example, in 2019, nearly one in five or 19 percent of the entire self-employed workforce was over, 50, over 60. And um, the top one from the British Gerontology Society was highlighting there were a third of a million people over 70 in paid work in the UK. So there are a lot of people active in the workforce. So again, to um, echo what people have already said, that it's not as if um, everyone's total burden. But certainly in the library literature, which I looked at, um, this is tends to be seen as um, a problem. Um, I mean, there's quite a lot about it in the library literature. Uh, there's a the theme of young, ambitious librarians being held up by old, day, outdated old people who won't go. And so this is from, I think it was a New Zealand study um, with people's opinions about the workforce and what had to be done to improve the library workforce. Um, the participants raised concerns about the difficulty of encouraging older staff who've not kept up to date with changes and are not prepared to move out of their comfort zone to update their skills or exit the profession. Um, and also a theme of older people discriminating against younger people, ignoring their ideas and stereotyping and insulting young people. Um, and so, as I said, there is a there is a kind of body of library literature which is worrying about this old workforce and how you kind of need to get rid of the dead wood and how you're going to do that, um, which is fundamentally kind of ageist. And I'm not saying there aren't older people who are st stuck in their ways, and not prepared to move out of their comfort zone, but I I think there are also people of all ages who one could categorise that way. 
and also a good management strategy is to develop people not to kind of brand them as dead wood. Also, um, one uh, thing that emerges from the management literature is the idea that when younger people are talking about older people, they may talk about them as if everyone who is older becomes more powerful, whereas obviously not everyone ascends up whatever hierarchy they're in. And what they call the career timetables hypothesis involves expectations of how individuals move up the organizational hierarchies, become older and more experienced. Employees who lag behind on this schedule, you know, hence surrounded by younger individuals in their work unit, are more likely to face discrimination. And they might be resented because they're seen as being older and that they ought to be more powerful and perhaps treated as if kind of resented in the same way as they were, but also looked down on because they've reached that age and they haven't managed to rise up. So they might get a kind of dual discrimination. And thinking back, reflecting back, I think I can um, remember instances of that in workplaces I've been in, unfortunately. And obviously, of course, um, the workplace discrimination can be intersectional, um, but and the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights um, has, uh, which is a report I referred to a couple of times, very useful report, um, talks about this issue, um, intersectionality with uh, discrimination against uh, particular sexual orientation, gender, ethnicity, and so forth. Um, I'm going to just highlight in particular, uh, and, and, and also this might be a good point, I think I've put that in the text chat, to just say the obvious thing, which is that if you're discriminated against for one thing, it doesn't excuse you for being discriminatory um, against someone who's got a different protected characteristic. Um, so one um, intersection is obviously between gender and age, and I thought I'd just say a few words about that, having looked at some of the literature about it. And the quotation at the top is from uh, a European study of um, female managers, um, where one of the interviewees says that an old male grey eminence is looked at in a different way than an old grey woman. And the literature talks about lookism, kind of depending on judging women more by their looks than they do men. Girling, treating people like girls uh, in, in the way that they're talked to and expected to behave. Um, assumptions about women having children. So in many countries, this, it's now against the law to, to, to discriminate. Um, or to ask questions about, do you intend to have children at interviews? But nevertheless, there are other ways in which it may not be spoken about, but the assumption may still be there. And ageism. Um, and the study uh, it was a joint, two studies have been done, one in Scotland, one in Finland, and then the authors wrote a joint article about it. And their conclusions were that the optimal time for women managers seemed to be relatively short, somewhere between 40 and 50 years of age. Before that, they were kind of patronised and treated like girls, and after that, they were um, kind of like treated like old bags and thought to be past it um, and should be going away and knitting or whatever. Um, another study which I looked at, which was to do with librarians, was um, brought in the cultural expectations. So this was um, surveying some academic librarians in Ghana, um, and there were issues around the cultural expectations of women in Ghana about what you would be doing at different stages of your life. So this is something which is, is very culturally dependent as well. Um, so Maggie says that she likes to knit, but she doesn't. Um, you don't want to treat it if, if that's all you can do. <laughs> yes, so, so I'm not anti-knitting. <laughs> um, and in terms of aspects of workplace ageism, people um, have identified um, there's issues to do with attitudes, behaviours, practices and policies, um, and, the, and you can't necessarily sort everything out by practices and policies. You have to also work hard at influencing attitudes and behaviours. And there are varying, various um, different 
problems depending on the sector you're working in. Obviously, ageism might be worse in some sectors than others. And um, and Selby mentioned that uh, being a professor, he hadn't felt the bin ageism. And I would agree it's not as bad in academia as it is in, in some other um, areas. And also that there is implicit ageism even when explicit doesn't. So there have been quite a lot of studies about recruitment. And again, that was mentioned earlier in the text chat. Um, uh, so I give a quote there. And this was a study where there were, if I remember correctly, um, some CVs given out and with book associated with pictures of, of people at different ages. Um, and with the same CV, people read different things into it, depending on whether the person looked young or old. And they were more positive about if it looked younger, and they were more negative if the person, the applicant, looked older. And there have been quite a lot of similar kinds of studies. So even when there are policies in, in place about you're not supposed to be ageist, that people's um, attitudes can sometimes interfere with that. So in terms of trying to do something about this, um, which, as I've said, it, when I put this together, I was thinking about libraries, but I think it probably applies to all kinds of workplaces. Um, so, first, there's obviously age inclusive human resources policies and age blind promotion and recruiting procedures. Um, and this includes looking at job descriptions, performance of creation criteria, um, and adverts as well. Um, There's quite a few studies looking at adverts and job descriptions and showing sometimes the required characteristics are things which might be associated more with young people and so it might, might, might be biased towards you thinking that a young person was going to be more suitable than an old person. And also a lack of assumptions about ambitions at different life stages. You might have a young person who's really ambitious and you might have someone who for various reasons hasn't seemed ambitious at earlier stages of career but suddenly perhaps because they, their children um, are now grown up or their financial situation is better or they've stopped having to care for a, a parent, suddenly they do want to be ambitious. So not making assumptions um, that it's only that there's kind of a, a path that's the same for everyone and everyone feels the same at, at each age. And in terms of age inclusive, it's, it is also a question of looking at wordings um, quite carefully um, and so it's a lot of detail as well as the big picture it's actually kind of small detail as well. Um, a number of articles that talk about this um, advocate multi-generational teams so again I'll listen to text chat but this is just the text off the slide. Um, and avoiding stereotypes in mentoring doesn't assume, don't always assume that an older person meant as a younger person, or that someone up the further up the hierarchy meant as someone further down the hierarchy. It might, um, I, and I think this is just generally open, creative, and useful work practices and thinking: what is it that you're mentoring, and who is actually best placed to do the mentoring? And it isn't always in line with hierarchy or age. Um, discussing explicitly issues such as communication, working style and transitions, the transitions that people need to make as they get older or when they come into different life stages. And again, not assuming that everyone's going to be thinking the same thoughts at the same age. And in terms of communication and working style, I mean, again, I think this is just good workplace practice. But thinking about whether any ageism is coming into it. In terms of continuing professional development, sorry I didn't spell that out, that's what I mean by CPD. Um, taking different learning styles into account and catering for different approaches to CBD. So people, people at, I'm not sure, can you still hear me? Yes, yes. Sorry, my green um, thing disappeared. Um, so sometimes there's a certain assumptions that um, 
people will be the same in terms of what kind of learning style they like. And it used to be, obviously, that this kind of learning style of people sitting down and listening to things was everyone's preferred learning style. And then it seems to, in a lot of workplaces, it's now gone to the almost the opposite, that the only way you can learn is being experiential um, and by doing role play. And uh, so it's... But, but, Unfortunately, organizations quite often seem to go for just one style rather than um, thinking through the different types of styles that ideally they should be catering for. And also that some are more appropriate for people with different disabilities or um, with different issues that they might have at different life stages. And finally, in terms of reviewing work practices, again, I'll type this in. Um, it's remembering but because just because powerful people in organizations are older, it doesn't mean that all the older people are powerful. Um, I've just noticed that Maggie was making the point that some older workers are used to being abused in the workplace. A lot was tolerated when we were young in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And I think um, so I went into the workforce in the um, 70s. Uh, late 70s, mid to late 70s. Um, and certainly I think there are things then, um, even then, that uh, I wouldn't put up with, or people of my age wouldn't have put up with later on. Um, Recognising and challenging implicit stereotypes, which I think can be difficult. And obviously it's the case where speaking up on someone else's behalf is always a good thing. And Reflecting, um, I mean, not, I think many of you aren't from the library world, but um, sometimes I feel that because there's a lot of effort in challenging the old types of librarian stereotype, which is still there, the librarian with the cardigan and the bun saying shush, it still comes up, it comes up in films and computer games and the media, um, and it's good to counter that stereotype because it is a stereotype but sometimes it seems to be being countered by um, another stereotype which doesn't have any old people in it at all it just has young vibrant librarians of which are, who are varied in but they're all young um, and so I think it's important not to create ageist stereotypes in the library profession so I'm coming on now to um, thinking about ageism and people that you're serving, you're providing some kind of service to. And there's a quote from a North American uh, research study of libraries. Um, just to say, I uh, note that Marley said that adult education takes into account the wide variety of learning styles, but often older adults want to have their own lifelong experience, values a rich resource and want to contribute in a variety of ways. Yes, that's quite true. I would, I would agree with that anyway. <laughs> but, um, so I quoted there from a, the, a qualitative research study, um, which started by looking at what kind of um, services are being offered to older people and looking at um, websites and so forth. At the public library study, the only services explicitly for older adults are homebound delivery services, assistive technologies in the commuter lab, and partnerships with retirement communities. All three services frame older adults at a time of disability and decline. And so it's now talking about services specifically aimed um, by librarians at older people. And I think these events say something about the people providing them, i.e. that there is some stereotyping going on. And I have a quote here from the American Library Association uh, in 2006, 21 ideas for older people for the 21st century. And some of them are, are very worthwhile. I've been a bit mean, but I did do highlight two here, which is offer programs on Burma shave signs, local trivia, music boxes and World War Two, and have a show of wedding fashions from the 30s and 40s. And this is supposed to be 21 ideas for older people for the 21st century. And it does make the assumption, I, uh, um, I'm, I'm, uh, well, I suppose in 2006, how old would I have been? Uh, 14 years old. So I would have been in my late 50s um, and technically older, but 
Obviously, I wasn't around in the 1930s and 40s, so it's making assumptions that if you're old, somehow you're only interested in the Second World War and old-fashioned. In fact, I have observed this um, in uh, before I, in a, the previous university I worked at, Strathclyde University, we they had a very innovative management development program for all the business school students, and I was it was. Um, uh, cross-disciplinary and I was involved in that and uh, all the students had to form um, and there were about 400 of them they formed teams of about seven people and they all had to work on an idea for a holiday um, kind of a paid idea for a holiday and then they'd pitch it um, and so it was quite competitive in some ways and quite a good exercise for them because they had to do the market research and things and then pitch why this was a good holiday idea. And the, the ideas of holidays they had for older people were all around people, uh, this stereotype of the older person um, who, who loves the Second World War um, songs. And also I've quoted there, so go back to my actual presentation, um, but uh, the, the Canadian research study that I'm quoting for as well, as well it was uh, I found one USA and one Canadian study that were particularly rich in having explored this um, <laughs> explored this area. Um, and the Canadian study said that programs offered by the five Canadian library systems that were public library systems that were studied were fairly traditional and did not appear to address older adults as composites of diverse ethnicities, sexual orientations, family arrangements, relations. So again, an assumption that everyone was kind of grandparent in a traditional family unit and um, was heterosexual, um, but probably not interested in sex anymore because they were old um, and so forth. So. There is evidence again that uh, libraries could be improving what they're providing in terms of services to older people. So first of all, um, thinking about spaces and looking at um, the evidence from library articles and also um, some other studies that are out there. There's a really useful publication from the World Health Organization, Age-Friendly Environments in Europe, a Handbook of Domains for Policy Action. It doesn't sound very exciting, but it's a really useful compilation of guidelines for how environments can be made friendly for older people. Um, and it does it in a lot of detail. There's a whole section to do with information and communication. Um, and it's based on various research studies and kind of lays out, very, as I said, very detailed guidelines. So I think that's really worth looking at in terms of thinking about. Um, and one of the things it points out is is um, how older people like a variety of options um, in terms of spaces, virtual spaces, also physical spaces, ways in which they can communicate with um, other older people, with younger people and so forth, and thinking about providing things in different formats. Um, obviously physical and visual virtual accessibility and as are always universal divine principles will help users and also having dedicated spaces in larger libraries for older people um, and it was pointed out in um, the detailed study I mentioned that younger people um, would have there be this kind of perhaps a teenager's library somewhere for the children um, which was seen as a safe space but that perhaps there should be consideration of having dedicated spaces for older people um, in which they could feel comfortable. And that was their space that was actually, um, which is not something I, don't, I think I've seen anywhere. Um, in terms of events, um, events aimed at all ages, but um, one thing that you quite often see when you see services for older people is a big emphasis on intergenerational events, as if you can only have good events, in creative events, if they involve young people as well as old people, um, rather than thinking just there can be creative, exciting events just for older people. Um, so if they are intergenerational, not just seeing them as from the younger person's perspective, but also from the older person's. 
Um, for some people, having any age badging is going to put off people. So you might create some events with older people in mind, but then just not label them as such. Um, but use older people in the publicity material, think about using the terminology that might appeal to them, but not actually say this is for uh, old silver servers or whatever. Also listen to their needs without preconceptions. So for an example is given of someone who realized, who by listening realized that there was a, a big gap for people knowing how to do online dating, that people who hadn't, who were widowed or didn't have partners or just suddenly decided they'd like a partner, who weren't so sure about the etiquette of online dating and didn't necessarily want to go about it in the same way as younger people um, might want to form their own older people's etiquette for online dating. Um, and integrate into existing interests. For example, there's um, one group in the North American intense study of older people's needs, um, which had an example of a librarian who'd observed a quilting group and, and got into conversation with the regular quilting group and found that actually it was becoming a, a place in which to exchange information about technology and tech tips and so actually plugging sort of plugging into that would be more effective than holding a separate um, session about technology it was uh, actually going in with their interests. Um, the sad thing with that was it was also an example of a librarian who'd taken the initiative but they were doing it kind of under the counter it wasn't officially approved they weren't supposed to do that sort of thing even though it was an effective thing to do. Um, and then almost finally, I've just got two more slides about this and then just a quick couple of ones about virtual worlds. Um, so ideas for teaching and supporting older people and an obvious one is older people teaching older people and actively recruiting older volunteers and librarians. Um, again, from that study where it was found that although anyone of any age could have rep replied to the calls for um, people to help out in supporting technology. It turned out that when you looked at the channels they were using, they were channels that tended to be used by younger people. So if you actually wanted to recruit older people to think about the communication channels they were using and to make sure you use them. Um, so Maggie said, uh, a 71 year old friend of mine who is a computer phobic learned how to do dating sites for people over 50 and she got a lot of communications for people she'd like to meet. Her children were appalled she wasn't acting her age. It was good for her. Good for her. Um, the second point was librarians and volunteers learning from older people actually thinking about what they can learn from them and there are some examples given in the literature and events that use skills of people of varied ages so there's a quote there from uh, another study one library offered a program where older adults taught youth how to fix small appliances a program such as this stands in contrast to the ageist assumption that daily activities of those who are no longer in the labor force hold little practical value um uh one Thing I noticed from looking at the literature was that um, most of the articles that mentioned older people were about public libraries. Um, but I think this is also an issue in academic libraries. So I um, we're actually a postgraduate only department, and uh, I coordinate the distance learning, in fact, distance learning for. Um, master's level students in library and information services management and previously I coordinated the on-campus librarianship program um, and in particular with those two programs a lot of the students are over 30 and some have their own families and so forth and their own caring responsibilities but all of our students are out of their early 20s and the services and messages from the university and I think it's I've talked to other people and it's a common problem tend to be geared towards students in their late teens and early 20s um, and I've heard lots and lots of complaints from my students over the years and we do feed you know try and get this message through to the university but they don't seem to be very they don't seem to take it very seriously um, and finally although I'm not necessarily in tune with this idea but one idea I came across that academic libraries really should create programs for older people because it might be a significant source of philanthropic donations i.e they might die quickly and leave some money to the university uh, 
Um, so strategies, obviously, you can connect with older people's organisations, the ones run by older people. So in the UK, we have some some organisations like Age UK, which are really run by other people to support old people, and, and they're great. But I'm thinking more of older people's assemblies, local groups, which are run by the older people themselves. Um, and also look at examples from non-Western countries, because sometimes there's very interesting examples from there. So in the last few minutes, I just added a little bit about um, ageism and virtual worlds. And this is a group hug um, from the non-profit commons uh, a week and a bit ago. <laughs> I thought that, to me, that represents very nicely virtual worlds, which, which I... Where I feel there is a lot of support for people of, of all ages. And for those of you who I see assembled here in Second Life, these won't be um, unfamiliar, but I thought I would just raise them, um, particularly as some of the people watching this um, may not be so familiar. But I think problems, to start with the negative, include that there is research um, showing that uh, presenting as an older person in a virtual world draws pretty much the same prejudice as in um, a physical world. In fact, possibly even worse, because there are a few people who present with wrinkles and so forth. Um, and personally, I don't see why I should have to... Uh, my virtual self is virtual, so why I should have to reproduce um, my physical self, I'm not quite clear. And um, I think that comes to the second problem, that there are those who seem, well, and apologies to any of you <laughs> I'm offending anyone who's watching, but some people seem to be really obsessed by their virtual self has got to look exactly the same as their physical self, and I don't see why, but sometimes one can encounter prejudice saying, oh, no, you're 67, why do you look 20? And as far as I'm concerned, I just look like me, and so this is, this is a manifestation of me in Second Life. Um, I'm not presenting... I'm 67 in Second Life, just as I am in the physical world. Um, I'm not trying to look younger. I'm just presenting a, a version of myself. Um, but that certainly is an issue. Also, there is sometimes a prejudice against older people engaging in virtual worlds, just as some people feel older people should have got past doing computer gaming or any other activity. Uh, sex was already mentioned and dating. Um, Again, as if there ought to be only certain things that older people should be interested in. And accessibility, for example, devices not adapted for those with um, disabilities, which unfortunately failing health eventually does tend to come with older age. There are uh, already my fingers are a bit stiffer than they used to be. So I don't want to stereotype an older person always having disabilities. But pragmatically, um, especially as we get into the older old, it can be an issue and some devices can be frustratingly difficult to use. And lack of good connectivity. So one of my nightmares is ending up in a care home where there's appallingly low broadband and I can't, you know, if there's a second life or an equivalent, I can't. It's too poor and people are saying, oh, why do you want to do that, dear? You should just, you know, just listen to the... Just listen to old time music or something like that. Why you want to? to well, why would you want large broadband? Um, so I'm just looking through the text chat. Yes, I, uh, I can see. I, I won't. I'm aware that the I'm two minutes off when I should finish, and so I won't try and pick up the text chat at the moment because I've only got two more slides. So the opportunities, which actually are smaller here, but I think they're bigger. Basically, physical. Age is not evident at first class, I, um, so I think that people can take each other as they want. Um, uh, people do judge each other by appearances in, in virtual worlds as well, um, but at least it isn't a very, you, you can choose whether or not to present with your physical world disabilities or other characteristics that you're not happy with in the physical world. And there's so many examples, including many of the people in uh, standing, sitting in front of me, of all the people using their creativity and skills without ageist prejudice um, against them. I think it provides more opportunities. And so just finally to finish with this quotation from the British Gerontology Society, apologies, I hadn't um, put this last two into text chat and I will now. 
that people of all ages are privileged with the same rights and policies need to be applied at population level. Ageism, the stereotyping, prejudice and discrimination against people on the basis of their age has detrimental consequences for societies and individuals. So um, thank you for your attention. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Sheila. This is definitely applicable to many fields beyond librarianship. And I know we all um, got a lot out of your presentation today.